What's happening, Boot Junkies? Mike Delgadio here, back with another video on Home Studio Setup for VoiceOver. And today we're going to talk about this microphone right here. This is the Austrian Audio OC16. You may recognize this mic as the little sibling of the Austrian Audio OC18, which I have here in the booth, and we're going to take a listen to and compare these two in just a minute. But I reviewed the OC18 back in 2020. And I was actually quite fond of that microphone. I ended up using it quite a bit in voiceover work. I did a whole bunch of, especially e-learning voiceover work with that microphone, became quite fond of it. And today we've got one that's similar in specifications, certainly looks very similar to it, but it's about half the price of the OC18. So let's dig in. Let's see what the OC16 has to offer. Now, I want to say right up front that Austrian Audio did send me this microphone so that I could make this review. But you'll see, it's not going to really affect my review. I don't really tell you to buy it or not to buy it or really pass judgment on it. My job here is to really help you decide if this is the right mic for you. So they're not going to have any editorial input. They're not going to see this video before you do. My job is really just to try and showcase this microphone show you everything that it can do, give you a good long listen to how it sounds, put it in context for other microphones, and really help you decide if you're going to part with $400, is this the microphone that deserves it? Let's see. So let's go through the specifications, see what this mic has to offer so that as you continue to evaluate the sound and see if you like it, you'll actually learn a little bit about the microphone itself. This first thing is that it is a cardioid pattern condenser microphone. Now, if you're new to selecting microphones, if you might be switching from a dynamic microphone looking to get your first condenser, and this is in your budget, a condenser microphone really means that it requires additional electricity to make it work. You get that electricity via the XLR cable, and on your interface, it's a, it's a switch that you activate on your interface. It might say 48V, it might say plus 48, it might say P, it might say P48, but there's a, a power that's required. The second part, cardioid, refers to the pattern. So if you're new to the world of microphones, the pattern, uh, each microphone has a different area of sensitivity. Some microphones are sensitive all the way around. Some microphones are sensitive just from one side, and they'll sound really much better from one side than the other. That's called a unidirectional mic, and, that form, and you'll often hear it called a cardioid. And it just refers to sort of the area of sensitivity in front of the microphone. Cardioid means it's really quite sensitive from one side and somewhat less from the other. And then as you move over to the side of the microphone, so I'm almost 90 degrees to the microphone now, you'll notice that it sounds it sounds different. You start to lose that high end, high end airiness and so forth. And then from the back of the microphone, it won't hear you very well at all. It's going to sound weird and echoey and it's just not going to sound right because it's really a unidirectional microphone cardioid pattern. We can actually see how much freedom of movement we have by looking at the, the cardioid graph, and you'll see that at different, at different frequencies, there is different drop-off as you move over to the side. How wide is that area where all of those shapes come together? And you see we probably have maybe 30 or 40 degrees of movement in front of it where you're going to sound the same no matter what. And then as you move off to the side, you can see that some of those frequencies, they become less sensitive. It's a very common thing in cardioid unidirectional microphones, but you can use that graph to get an idea of how much movement you have. So if you're a, if you're a singer, if you're a voice actor, and part of your process is to really move around the mic, you want to be able to find a mic that gives you plenty of freedom to do that in front of the microphone. The other thing that's really, uh, really helpful to look at when you're evaluating the microphone is to look at the, the, the frequency response graph, how sensitive the mic is and how much boosting or cutting it does at the different frequencies in the spectrum. So as we look at the frequency chart for this particular microphone, we can see that way down at the very lowest, lowest, lowest end, it is naturally rolling off some of the very lowest bass from looks to be about 40 hertz and down becomes somewhat less sensitive. And actually that's a, that's a perfectly fine design decision because most of the time, in your recordings, you're actually going to be removing everything from, say, 60 or 40 hertz and down because there isn't much, especially in a voice actor's voice, there isn't much down there. There's the mic will naturally rumble. All microphones naturally are sensitive to a rumble down at that, that part of the frequency spectrum. So it's perfectly fine to see that rolling off down in the, down the very lowest frequency. Then we have the, the central frequency where the bulk of our voice is from about 60 hertz to about, hmm, 
4,000, 5,000 hertz, that's where the, the, the most of our voice comes from. And we can see that across most of that spectrum, it's flat. It's trying to represent your voice exactly as you sound. And then as we get up into the higher part of the frequency, we start to see these, these bumps, these boosts. And we have a what you might call a presence boost to make you sound more present in the recording, I would say. Uh, but there's a, there's a boost around uh, 4,000, 5,000, maybe up to almost 6,000 hertz. Then it dips down in between. That's not something you see in every microphone. It dips down between 7 and 8,000 hertz and then comes back up again towards 10, 12,000 hertz. So what is it? What's happening there? So it, that first little bump is giving uh, presence to your voice. It's adding additional clarity, additional uh, 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 vibrancy to your voice. It's going to add, make it seem clearer. Then that dip down, that's actually a, just a design decision they make. But here's where it can come in handy for you. If you do have a sharp S sound, you have an S that whistles, that's sharp, a sibilant S. This microphone, that typically happens in the seven to 9,000 hertz range. And so having that dip down actually can be very handy because if you do have a sibilant S, you're probably going to equalize it out. You're probably going to compress that area with a de -esser. So having the mic give you an assist in that area it's actually not a not a bad thing. I'm not I'm not mad about that at all. And then above that range, it comes back up and gives you a sense of airiness, uh, a, a little additional sparkle to your voice. So it's actually a very interesting frequency chart and one that could be perfectly suited to a number of voices. And as we look at the rest of the technical specifications, we can see some of the other important things that you as a voice actor might be choosing in your microphone. So we've talked about the pattern and the directionality and, and so forth. Uh, but there's two more that, that may be important to you, for you. One is the, um, the sound pressure level, maximum sound pressure level. How loud can you be in front of the microphone? And the way they measure it here is a little bit on the scientific side. They take a specific frequency at a specific distance and they keep raising the volume until there's a distortion present in the microphone. But for us, it helps us give a determination of how easily will it be for us to physically overload the capsule in the microphone? So if you're doing anime, if you're doing a, a, a video game, something where you've got to scream, you want to know that you have a microphone that's not going to overload very easily. And with this, uh, what is it, uh, 148 decibels, that's actually quite loud. So if you're standing back from the microphone, you can really blast away. And it's unlikely that you're going to distort the diaphragm. You're going to overload the circuitry. You may overload in software if you've got your gain set wrong, but you're not going to physically overwhelm the microphone if you get too loud, as long as you're exercising proper mic technique. Now, on the other side, the other specification that we might look at is the equivalent noise, the self noise. How much noise does the mic introduce itself irrespective of the environment? Every microphone adds a little bit of noise due to the just electronic circuitry inside the microphone. Uh, and this one is 14 dB. Now, for a mic this price, that's a little tiny bit on the high side. There's other microphones in this price point and, and lower that would have single digit noise. Three, three and a half, four, five dB worth of self noise. Under normal circumstances, you're hearing it as, as I'm recording it. Do you notice a hiss behind it? You probably don't. But if you are recording a very, very quiet source that you then have to boost that level after the fact, that's when that noise can come into, into effect. For regular narration voice work, 14 dBA is going to be fine. If you're trying to capture the sound of a watch ticking, something extremely, extremely quiet, that's when that noise level could come into play. And this one is, I'd like to see it lower. It is a little bit on the high side at 14 dBA. As far as buttons and switches, some microphones have buttons and switches, some don't. This one does have one switch that has two positions on it, and that switch is a high pass filter. High pass simply means at a given frequency, lower than that frequency, you shall not pass. None shall pass. Higher than a frequency, the sound shall pass, high pass, above a certain frequency. And this one's in two positions. The first one, and we'll switch to it right now, do it by 
feel is a 40 hertz pass. So this means the microphone is naturally trying to reduce everything be below 40 hertz. And this is actually a pretty good setting for a typical voice acting scenario. For the most part, we want to have nothing below 40 hertz come into our recording. So it wouldn't be unusual. This is a good utility setting for a voice actor. Helps remove for your home studio. You got trucks going by outside. You got a furnace in another part of the house. This is going to naturally take away that rumble. The airport, the bus, the garbage truck. If they're off in a distance, it's the bass that's going to come through. So having a 40 hertz high pass actually can be quite helpful. Now, there's also a 160 hertz high pass. So the 160 hertz high pass is going to take a bit more bass away, but it's going to give you a lot more natural sounding response as you get farther and closer to the mic. So if the recording that you're doing, character work, something like that, requires you to get closer to the mic and farther away, this can negate something called the proximity effect. Proximity effect is a natural tendency for unidirectional mics, remember, not sensitive, sensitive, for unidirectional mics that as you get closer to them, they become not only louder, but bassier. I'm going to take that off now, all the way off. And you'll note that as I get closer to the microphone here, we do get a, a sense of bassiness. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. You want that bassiness to add richness to your voice. Sometimes you don't want it. And so having that high pass filter, that's what that can do. That can overcome or remove that proximity effect. So you get a little bit of, you get some options. You can also do it in software. You don't have to do it with the switch. That's why some microphones don't have to have that switch, don't have that switch at all. Um, we'll look at microphones that cost way more that don't have that switch. That's, it's okay. It's just a design decision. But it's good to know that it is here in case you do need to overcome that proximity effect. This microphone does use the same capsule that's present in their much more expensive OC18. This capsule is called the CKR6. It's a single diaphragm capsule. They also have a CKR12. It's a dual capsule for multiple different patterns beyond cardioid. Let's talk for a second about build quality. The build quality of the microphone is quite good. It's an all metal microphone. There's very low risk that you're going to damage it under normal handling. The basket on it, the grill is actually quite durable. It's, it gives a lot of resistance to, to, um, to deflection, actually even more so than the more expensive OC18, which does have you're not at risk of damaging the, the, the capsule under normal circumstances, but the OC18's grill does deflect a bit more. This one is transparent, but it's also, it's, it's very rigidly made. In the package that when you buy it, it does come with a soft sided case with foam inside. So you can put the microphone and the shock mount away in the case. So if you do worry about damaging this, as long as you take care of it, put it away in its case very unlikely that you're going to, going to damage it under normal handling. So as long as you treat this piece of sensitive equipment like it's a piece of sensitive equipment, you're going to be fine. They give you the provision to, to safely store this microphone for the long term. So let's do some sound comparisons at this point. One of the things that I think I can do to try and help you decide if this is the right mic for you is to place it in the context of other microphones that are on the market. You'll find that each microphone has its own sound quality. Some you'll like, some you'll say, oh, I don't think that would fit my voice very well. And I think one of the ways that I can help you translate from my voice to how it might work for you is to put it in context with a bunch of other microphones. So right off the bat, we'll start with a comparison between its sibling. This is the OC18, the made in Austria cardioid condenser microphone. Now it's got a couple of other features that are not present in the OC16, part of the probably the cost cutting to get it down to that that less expensive that less expensive price point. There's a pad switch on here that can attenuate the sensitivity of the microphone that's not present in the OC16. But as we go back and forth, you'll see on the screen there'll be text that names a microphone. In whichever microphone you see with the text, that's the one that you're hearing right now. So I feel like this gives you a good way to make a decision as we listen back and forth. And you can start to get a sense of the tonal differences between what particular characteristic does this microphone have that's different from this microphone? Do I like the way one sounds compared to the other? You'll see as we look at the different microphones, they'll sound different. Some will sound, oh, I like the way that sounds better. Some will say, oh, I don't like the way that one sounds. It's really just to help you decide where this one where this one fits. 
So first, this was a comparison, a sound comparison, between the Austrian Audio OC18 at about $850, I think, and the Austrian Audio OC16 at about $400. Okay, next up, I want to take it a little bit in the opposite direction. This is the first of two Lewitt microphones that we'll use to sort of place the Austrian Audio. I'm choosing two because these are both Austrian companies. They do share some similarities, I think some similar inspiration, but you'll see there's two very different approaches to the resulting sound. This is the LCT 440 Pure, sort of the the, the, the mid-level entry in the Lewitt lineup. A little bit less expensive than the OC16, but I think we should note that there's a, a difference, a difference in sound between these two. I think of the, the Lewitts as being brighter microphones than the Austrian Audio. They're, they're, neither of them sound empirically bad, not to me, but I do feel like I sound qualitatively different. Do we like the way one sounds compared to the other? Do we think that this is the, the mic that would sound best for our voice? See what we're trying to accomplish here? Hopefully it's helping. Okay, so that is the sound of the Lewitt LCT 440 Pure. Now I've got the Rode NT1 next to the OC16. And I think these are two microphones that approach their high end in a similar but different, in a different way. These both have that sort of a little bit more contoured high end. And the Rode NT1 is known for having a nice smooth high end. So does the OC16's high end compare favorably to the NT1? Do you like the way it sounds better? But the NT1, an extremely popular microphone, costs a little bit less. But you can see it's bigger. Uh, you know, and I don't even have the the, shot, the pop filter in front of it, but it's a it's a it's a bigger microphone if that matters, narrower, but bigger dimensionally. Uh, they're just two two different microphones. They use different capsule sizes. They are different capsule styles. So I wanted to just give a sense of, okay, here's the OC16. How does it stand up against the really uh, popular Rode NT1? So hopefully now that gives you a chance to hear these two side by side and help you decide. Which one do you prefer? Which one do you find more preferable? All right, let's keep going. All right, we're going to now switch to microphones that are more expensive than the OC16. And so we're coming back to the Lewitt microphones because this is their uh, LCT 540 Pure. It costs about $700, considerably more expensive than the uh, $400 of the OC16. Now, this one has a, a, a different feature set. Uh, I'd say that the manufacturing quality is a little bit different, but you're, you're paying considerably more. But really what I want us to concentrate on is the sound comparison. So now I want you to start thinking about, does the OC16 hold its own against the more expensive microphones? So we're out of, you know, thinking about qualitatively, how do these compare in the somewhat similar price point? We're now looking at mic. We're going to now going to look at microphones. A lot of microphones that are considerably more expensive, to give this a chance to show that it can hold its own against the more expensive ones. Again, manufacturing tolerances might be different, but really, if we're thinking about this from a voice acting perspective and making money with our voice straight away, how does this microphone? How does it compare? We even yeah we're even. How do they compare? Do they compare favorably to each other? Does the OC16 sound like it could compete with the more expensive microphones to the, the sound quality in your ear? So this is the shootout between <laughs> the OC16 and the Lewitt 540 Sub-Zero. They call it Sub-Zero because this one has an extremely low noise floor, like 3.5 dBA, maybe even lower. And they say that that's as low as... I can't remember the exact number, but they say that this one has a self noise about as low as theoretically possible. And really what I, the, the reason I pulled this one out now, I recall is to see if this one literally is as quiet as a microphone can get. Do you notice a noise problem issue between the two? So 14 dBA, three, let's call it three dBA. Do you notice a hiss in the OC16 that isn't present as I go back to the uh, the LCT540 Sub-Zero? Is there, is there a difference? Is there a difference such that the noise floor is problematic? That's what I was hoping to try and demonstrate by making this mic selection. Okay, next up, we're going to compare the new Soyuz 1973 uh, cardioid condenser microphone. You see that this is a very different size. This one is 
double the cost of the OC16 at about $800. Review of this one coming up soon. Uh, but they're really positioning this one towards voice actors. So as we listen to the two, knowing that this one costs twice as much, if it is imparting a tonal difference, how much different is that? Is that object or not objectively, but subjectively to you? Do you're like, oh wow, that sounds so incredibly different that I'd be willing to go double the cost to look at something else? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on what your budget is and what you're looking to go for. But I thought this would be an interesting one. If you're looking for a brand new mic for voiceover work, you may be looking at learning about the Soyuz and a couple of the other microphones that are out in, in, in the more expensive price points. So this will help you decide if this one is competitive to your ears to the more expensive microphones. So that's been the Soyuz 1973. Let's go up again in price. Moving up again in price, we now are, sh are listening to the Telefunken TF11. This one is more of the entry level at $900. This is the entry level to the Telefunken series. This is one of their less expensive microphones. The Telefunken microphones be can become really quite expensive, really aspirational microphones, the ones that you'd find in the most expensive well-off studios around. Uh, so I thought this would be interesting. I think we should find that there's a tonal difference between these two. I would certainly expect there to be a tonal difference between these two. But these do, <laughs> Telefunken and Austrian Audio, if we, re if we rewind all the way back in history, I think there's some common inspiration way in the back, especially around that capsule. I don't, I can't remember which capsule the TF-11 uses, but Telefunken with their Elam, E-L-A-M, 251, Elam, E-L-A-M, I don't actually know how you say it officially. The 251 uses the same capsule style that is present in the AKG C12. And I think there's a, a historic inspiration that has trickled down through the ages to get down to these two microphones. So I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're going to sound different, but if we think about the evolution from way back starting you know, 40 or 50 years ago, thinking about those microphones and the impact that those have had, they lead us to these, potentially these two microphones as, as examples, Telefunken versus Austrian Audio. I think they both have, a, they share a, a common inspirational history. So I thought it'd be interesting to see at the $900 versus the $400, how these two microphones compare. And hopefully now you've had a chance to hear the difference between the two. So now I thought I'd show, show the comparison between the OC16 and probably one of the more standard voiceover microphones that, as you get up the historically, one of the microphones that finds itself into a lot of voice actors' lockers is the TLM-103. Some people love this microphone. Some people go, well, I don't like the way the TLM-103 sounds. It's, uh, I think it's a bit of a divisive microphone, but you do find it talked a lot about in voice acting circles. So I thought it would be an interesting comparison to see the microphone that many voice actors want and how the OC16 compares to it. So if you are trying to get to that aspirational sound of the TLM-103, you think that that's the thing that you have to have in your locker. How close is the OC16 sound? I don't know if they're going to sound alike or not. You're going to hear this at the same time I am. But I, I wanted to at least make a comparison between the two so you could get a sense of, do I, need, do I need to spend the, what is it, $1,200 now for the TLM-103, three times as expensive as the OC-16? Again, manufacturing differences. Neumann has a certain uh, uh, je ne sais quoi that, ad, that adds to the, uh, to the mystique of the Neumann microphone. It's a, it's a premium brand. And this, again, is one of, the, one of the more inexpensive Neumann microphones. So not exactly their entry-level mic, but it's close to it. This is in the beginning of the Neumann line, much as this is in the beginning of the Austrian audio line from a capability standpoint. So TLM-103, you see this a lot in voice acting, so I wanted to at least give you a sense of the difference between these two, 1200, 400. Okay, now we're getting into the aspirational mic territory. What we have now is the OC-16 compared to the Soyuz 017FET, 017FET, 17 FET. I've heard it referred in a couple of different ways, but this is a, the, there's two versions of this microphone. There's the really hyper expensive, like 
$4,500 tube version. And I think this one runs about $2,300, $2,400 in the transistor, the, uh, the, the FET version. And so I thought it, it, Soyuz microphones are, are characterized, as I mentioned before, they are characterized by adding a certain timbre, a certain quality to the sound. And we should find that there's a pretty pretty big difference, I would guess. Again, you're hearing this at the same time I am. Pretty big difference between the way these two microphones sound. So I thought, well, let's just see. Like what, when we start to get up into the rarefied airs, the, the, you know, the, the beginnings of the, the really super expensive microphones, 20, what I say, 23, 22, $2,300 for this, uh, for the Soyuz. How much different? What are we, what are we, what are we listening to when we hear the difference between these two microphones just in their raw state? What separates the two? 423, almost, you know, way, way, way more expensive. What's the difference between the two? Does the Soyuz character, does the OC have, uh, OC-16, does, does it have its own sort of je ne sais quoi that, that makes the microphone sound preferable? I don't know. Let's... Let's look at what that, what some people would think with these this really gorgeous Soyuz microphone. What does it have, and does any of the OC16 translate over? Does it give you a sense of where this one fits? I don't know. I don't know. I thought it'd be cool to show it, so here I am showing it. We'll have one more. All right, and finally we have the Neumann U87 at like thirty six hundred dollars, thirty three hundred dollars. A really expensive microphone. I paid for this a long time ago. 30, over $3,000. It's an expensive microphone, but it's considered, if there's a studio standard microphone that is, if you're in a recording studio, if you're, if you're making money as a studio booking and musicians, what microphones gotta be there? I'd say it's the Neumann U87. That kind of microphone kind of has to be there. It's a very aspirational mic. It's very expensive. It's aspirational, and it's not necessarily the easiest mic to use. It doesn't have a super high sound pressure level. It's got a sound that some people love. It's got a sound that some people are not so in favor of. Uh, but I do think that uh, you know, for for many recording studios, you'll you'll find this microphone. Certainly, when I was going into voiceover studios, sort of in then times. The U87 was a microphone that you would commonly find. I think that for voice acting, it's not necessarily the mic you need as a voice actor. I don't think it's the mic you gotta, you gotta have. But I do think it's interesting to, to at least hear the difference between the $400 mic and the $3,000 plus mic. The one that, you know, is found in studios all around the world that people save up for. How does this compare to the OC16? Hopefully... Hopefully now you've heard how this microphone fits into the landscape of microphones and has given you a sense of, yeah, I, that's the mic I want. That's, that's the one I want to spend my $400 on. If that's the case, hopefully this, this video has helped. If it has, click like, click subscribe. Let me know what you think. I, I'd appreciate it. Uh, but hopefully... Hopefully now you've really gotten a, a good overall sense, and I've done my job to give you the best possible overview sense of the OC16 and if it's right for you in your mic locker for your voiceover work. That's all I got for you today. I, I really do. I really hope it helps. I hope that helps. And just what I want, ultimately, what I want for you is to get a microphone any microphone, maybe uh, a $400 cardioid Austrian microphone. But what I really want you to do is I want you to find a microphone so that you can get out there and you can record something amazing. That's all I have for you today. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.